It's my distinct pleasure to be moderating the launch event for the new OECD publication, Does Higher Edu Education Teach Students to Think Critically? Edited by Dirk van Dam and Doris Zanner. Dirk is previously project leader at the OECD. Doris is chief academic officer at the Council for Aid to Education, or CLA in the US. As you will learn in the presentations and discussions to come, this publication explores how a college qualification is not necessarily a guarantee of cultivating skills such as literacy, critical thinking skills, problem solving, analytic reasoning and communications competency, which, although fundamental, appear to be frightfully lacking in many college graduates today. The work laid out in this report could be considered a continuation of the HALO project at the OECD which took on the mission of assessing higher education learning outcomes. This undertaking was fraught with heated debate concerning its feasibility, and the OECD could not pursue it further. Nonetheless, interest in the project persisted and was championed by the Council for Aid to Education, which developed the CLA International Assessment. This report compiles data and analysis of this initiative. From the moment I took on the task of producing this publication, I knew we were onto something. It made me think of an assignment I handed in at university, which probably could have been slightly better researched, maybe better formulated with more time to do so. With the deadline looming, I consulted as many sources as, as I could to patch together an argument and reach the all-important word count. I thought that I was demonstrating that by quoting information vaguely relevant to the topic, I understood it. Needless to say, my professor, who came to be one of the champions of my academic career, invited me to her office to review this essay. Taking the cap off a red felt pen and highlighting every quote or excerpt, I would say, exceeding three lines, which I had included as a standalone passage in order to complete it. And she told me that this was not demonstrative of critical thinking. It would be interesting to see what I would have scored on the CLA plus international assessment, both before and after this exchange with my professor. And for this reason, I can confidently say that the report is of great personal interest to me. Joining me on stage today are Barbara Ischinger, former director for education and skills at the OECD and promoter of the a HALO study, along with Doris Sanner of the Council for Aid to Education and Dirk van Dam, a previous OECD colleague of mine. Judith Eaton, former president of the Council for Higher Education Accreditation and CAO board member, has joined us online to share her experience and insights. And we will also hear video interventions from Andreas Schleicher, director for education and skills at the OECD, and Bob Yayak, CEO and president of the CAE. Finally, our deep thanks to Zeit Stiftung, who have kindly agreed to host this event in the beautiful Butzerius Law School. And I will now pass the floor to Meinhard Weizmann, CEO of the Law School, and then to Tatiana Mathieson, Head of Education and Training at Zeit Stiftung. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction, dear Ms. Mathieson, dear Ms. Ischinger, dear panel, dear participants in the room, as well as all the participants joining remotely. Welcome today at Buserius Law School here in our moot court. Usually this place is occupied by young students who are interested to learn the rules that are the basis for our society. They have decided to study law. But what does that actually mean to study law? Of course, legal studies are about the legal norms, about a certain syntax, it's about the context and its interpretation by the courts. But ultimately, history shows that simply studying and learning law is not enough to be a good lawyer. And by good, I mean someone who adheres to the reason of law, as expressed in the quote attributed to Gustav Radbruch, law is the will to justice. To reach this ultimate goal, we need the ability to look from the outside at the rules in force today and to ask critically what effects they have on the life of the individual and the existence of society. In fact, we have a chair uh, about uh, critical or the critique of law. That's why I'm particularly pleased that today's event, organized by the Zeit Foundation, the Council of Aid to Education, and the OECD, makes critical thinking itself 
as the core focus. I personally believe, and I do so in the spirit of the founder of the Zeit Foundation, Gerd Butzerius, that overcoming past and present challenges can only succeed if we teach ourselves and, above all, young people not to accept the circumstances, here in particular the laws, as something given, but to recognize and accept that they can be questioned and potentially changed. Since 2000, we have tried to be a place here at Butzerius Law School where this elusive qualification of critical thinking can unfold, grow, and consolidate. Law, in particular, thrives on debate. So our professors tell me again and again that in addition to our beautiful campus, it is the students who not only nod eagerly, but take sides and sometimes even disagree wholeheartedly that make working here so appealing. You might have wondered about the name of this room as a moot court. Moot courts are simulated court or arbitration proceedings where students learn to write memorials and subsequently practice the oral agreement. This trains both their debating skills as well as the passion to take sides. Consequently, we could not have chosen a better room to emphasize the need for critical thinking in higher education. Thank you very much. I wish us all an enriching evening. And I hand uh, over the uh, room to Tatiana Matisen. Thank you. Thank you, Maynard. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to all of you. My name is Tatjana Mathiesen. It's a really great pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of the Zeit Stiftung and uh, to the event here today at the Bucharest Law School in Hamburg. I'm also very excited to send a great hallo und willkommen to those who are not able to be here in this beautiful town and to be with us, with us here today but they are joining us via Zoom, and I do not know where to look to say all the people who are with us today, which I really appreciate very much, uh, want to say really hello, and I'm very thankful that you are joining us. When Barbara Ischinger invited us a couple of months ago to launch the book together with, jointly with the OECD and the, uh, the Council of Aid to Education, the book on Does Higher Education Teach Students to Think Critically?, we did not hesitate one second. We said, of course, yes, we will do that. Because education, be it the primary or secondary or the higher education and the tertiary section, these are all at the heart of our work in, in, in the, at the Zeitstiftung. The Buteris Law School is the best example of that. And we couldn't have pulled off this event without the hard work and dedication of Dirk van Damme of my colleague, Katrin Wischert. I can tell you, I didn't see this woman anymore <laughs> the last weeks because she was working so hard in organizing this event. And to the Bucerius event and to so, to so many others who were really um, having invested all the, 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 the power, I wouldn't say, but uh, the efforts to make this event happen today. We find the question that the study poses very intriguing and very interesting. And um, for me, for example, there are three questions which I want to highlight. Are students proficient in the so-called generic skills, critical thinking, problem solving, and written communication when they leave university? Do the qualifications and university degrees keep their promise and able students to be successful in the labor market and for the workplace tomorrow, in the future? What about the assessment of higher education? Do we need a PISA for academic performance, similar to the assessment of the learning outcomes of 15-year-old students? These three questions are only a few, but I'm very much looking forward to all the other questions, <laughs> to the wonderful and fantastic speakers we have tonight with us, or today with us, and especially my thanks goes to Andrea Schleicher, who will set the stage with his speech, Barbara Ischinger, who will 
tell us about the long and winding road <laughs> towards transparency of what can students learn, to Judith Eaton, who will share with us insights into learning outcomes and the quality of higher education, Doris Zana, who will present the methodology of the assessment of critical thinking, and last but not least, Dirk van Damme, who together with Doris Zana uh, are the editors of the OCD book and who will present the main findings of the study. I hope that our event will inspire us with a lot of ideas and a lot of discussion and many, many questions who will be moderated by Stephen Flynn. Thank you very much. I'm Barbara Ischinger. On behalf of OECD, I would like to very cordially welcome all the participants here in the room and, of course, the participants online. And you should know that 1,200 have registered online for this webinar. So this is very exciting. I promise our session will not be dull. You will hear some astonishing and impressive news. Let me thank Reinhard Weizmann, the CEO of the Buserius Law School, and uh, Dr. Hartung, the head of the Zeitstiftung, who just walked in, as well as, of course, um, Tatjana Mathisen, also from the Zeitstiftung. She has really helped us a lot to make this work. And thank you for the hospitality. Dear online participants, I'm afraid you will miss the reception. Well, it would have been quite a challenge to host 1,200 people. So enjoy the evening also online. Thank you. You'll hear more from me later on. We'll now hear from Judith Eaton. Oh, sorry, Bob, Bob Yayak, the video from Bob Yayak. We cannot uh, hear you, Bob. Can you hear me? One moment. Could you go sure. again? Sure. Can yeah. you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Great. Well, hello, everyone. Guten Tag, Guten Abend. Uh, so I'm Bob Yayak. I'm the CEO and president of CAE, Council for Asian Education. I would like to welcome everyone uh, to this very important event. I'd like to thank the OECD for the great partnership we've had over the years, our hosts for today's event, Doug Sifton, our expert presenters, the authors of the report, the educators and administrators at each of the participating institutions, and most of all, of course, the students who did the most difficult work in taking this session. Um, and last but not least, the CAE leadership and team that supported this international effort. So as you uh, have heard earlier, um, this evening you'll hear about the importance of generic skills and from a variety of perspectives. Um, but I think also you'll hear the role that organizations such as the OECD, CAE, and higher education leaders must play to provide students the best chance of success in their future endeavors. And for those of you that don't know CAE very well, I'll just give you a quick little introduction. Um, CAE grew out of the RAND Corporation, if you're familiar with RAND. Um, and we maintain that same emphasis on reliable and valid assessment, providing insight into student proficiency. At CAE, our focus is on the student, and our mission really is to improve student outcomes. And as you'll hear in much more detail, we assess critical thinking, problem solving, and written communication skills through a performance-based assessment. We know these are the skills most in demand by employers, but we also know they're essential for academic success. So we are based in science. Our team is comprised of researchers and assessment experts and performance test experts. We're supported by a wide range of outside experts in assessment and translation, as well as everyone in the countries we work in. Our assessments are used both in secondary and higher education, as we believe the sooner students develop these generic skills, the better. In addition, we design and develop custom performance-based assessments for some of the largest US education providers. And interestingly, we are now working with higher education leaders to create critical thinking skills instruction to support that student improvement 
and really to answer the question, what do we do with the results of the assessment? How do we help our students? So we're very excited about this book launch today to share our research and insight and to continue our efforts to help higher education institutions improve student outcomes. So thank you very much for joining and I'm sure you will enjoy today's program. Thank you very much, Bob. We're now going to hear from Andrea Schleicher, who is the Director for Education and Skills at the OECD. My congratulations to the publication, as higher education teaches students to think critically. It's such a relevant question, and it's the same time one for which we have many opinions, but really very little evidence. This is a groundbreaking report that could change that. And it's the result of a really groundbreaking collaboration. On the part of the OECD, the credits go to my predecessor, Barbara Eschinger, who has been really the mastermind, the inspirator of OECD's work on assessing higher education learning outcomes. And also to my former colleague, Dirk van Damme, who's been pursuing this agenda relentlessly, despite many difficulties. And of course, it all builds on the Collegiate Learning Assessment, or CLA, by the Council of Aid for Education, which has pioneered and developed the instruments in collaboration with so many participating countries. What I personally believe this work will do is lay the foundations for placing greater weight on the quality of teaching in higher education. Teaching excellence really needs to attain the same status, the same recognition as academic research, which is still the dominant metric for valuing academic institutions. No? And whether you look at you know, rankings published by the media or research assessment frameworks or uh, performance-based funding. There are really powerful reasons to change this. And this project could be the cornerstone for that. University qualifications have become the entrance ticket for modern societies now. Never before have those with the right skills had the life chances they have today. And never before have those who struggle with a good education paid the price for that they pay today. I know there are always those who say, you know, the share of young people getting into universities or advanced vocational programs is getting too high. Well, you know, but they're usually talking about other people's children. And in the last century, they had probably argued that, you know, we have too many kids going into high school. The evidence is really clear. On average, across OECD countries, men with at least a bachelor's degree earn over $300,000 more than what they pay for their studies and losing earnings by studying. When you compare that with, with those who've only got a high school degree over their working life. No? And taxpayers too, get over $200,000 more for every graduate than what they invest in them. It's really hard to think of a better investment at a time where knowledge and skills have become the currency of modern societies. And very important, despite the rapid rise in graduates, we've seen no decline in their relative pay, which is so different from those with poor qualifications. But it's also clear that higher education is a really expensive entrance ticket to the knowledge society, not just in financial terms, but also in terms of the time and energy that young people invest in that. And of course, people typically only get, you know, one of those tickets. That makes it so crucial to get it right. And that is all about the quality of learning outcomes. Measuring learning outcomes really helps us keep the finger on the pulse of what really matters in higher education. We all know that longer years of study don't automatically translate into better jobs and better lives. There's this toxic coexistence of unemployed university graduates on our streets while employers say we cannot find the people with the skills we need. Having robust metrics on the quality of learning outcomes helps us ensure that the right mix of knowledge and skills is delivered in effective and equitable in efficient ways. And the value of teaching as a key differentiator is only bound to rise as digitalization 
keeps pushing the unbundling of educational content, delivery, accreditation in higher education. Content, you know, in the digital age, anything you call your proprietary knowledge today is going to be a commodity available to anyone tomorrow. The pandemic has just amplified the trend. Accreditation, yeah, accreditation still gives universities enormous power, no? but just think a few years ahead, you know, what is micro-credentialing going to do to this? Or think of the rapidly improving capacity of employers to see through the degrees of people to what knowledge and skills they actually have. No? So that leaves the quality of teaching as perhaps the most valuable asset of modern universities. And it's going to become harder to hide poor teaching behind great research. Over the last 30 years or so, you know, the focus of higher education already changed rapidly in response to the changing nature of work and the forces of digitalization. Digitalization is connecting people, cities, countries, continents, in ways that have vastly increased our individual and our collective potential. Any of us can now change the world for, for better or worse. And together we can address the world's biggest challenges. But digitalization has also made the world more complex, more volatile, more uncertain. Digitalization can be incredibly democratizing. We can connect and collaborate with anyone. But digitalization can also concentrate incredible powers. You know, think about the Amazons, the Googles these days. Digitalization can be incredibly particularizing. The smallest voice can be heard everywhere. But it can also be incredibly homogenizing, squashing individual differences, cultural uniqueness. Digitalization can be incredibly empowering. You know, think about the new entrepreneurs and startups, you know, right here in Hamburg. No? But it can also be incredibly disempowering. No? When we become the slaves of algorithms we no longer understand. All that is driving amazing changes in the demand for skills. And what's losing most rapidly in value are routine cognitive skills. No? Memorizing something and expecting that's going to help you later in life. The dilemma for faculty today is that the kind of things that are easiest to teach and maybe easiest to test are precisely the kind of things that are easiest to digitize, to automate, to outsource. And we live in a world in which virality seems often privileged over the quality you know, in the distribution of information and knowledge. In this post-truth climate in which we now find ourselves assertions that feel right but that, that have no basis in fact become often accepted as fact. Now, algorithms that sort us into groups of like-minded individuals create social media echo chambers that amplify our own views and often leave us insulated from opposing arguments that could alter our beliefs. And these virtual bubbles homogenize opinions and polarize our societies. And they can be, have a, a significant and also adverse effect on our democratic processes. The scarcity of attention, but an abundance of information. They're living in this digital bazaar where anything that isn't built for the network age is cracking apart under its pressures. And all that makes it so critical that you know, critical thinking is being at the center of our attention. And also the other dimensions which the CLA Plus assesses are so important. Add to this the priority of universities to you know, induct not just a small minority into research capabilities, but nowadays to educate up to half of our populations with advanced knowledge and skills. And that's what you see in the rapid expansion of higher education and the establishment of more diverse types of institutions throughout the globe. There are close to 20,000 higher education institutions offering at least a postgraduate degree in 180 countries. And that historic shift has been accompanied by changes in funding regimes. The rising costs of higher education are increasingly borne by the students themselves. So it follows that students are becoming also more discriminating consumers. 
and in making choices between universities, mm -hmm. they're placing greater weight on securing valuable future employment. That's why institutions need to provide more relevant knowledge and skills through more effective teaching and learning. The reality is that most measures of education still focus on retention, on progression, on completion. But if we want to enhance the performance of higher education, we just need to know more about the practices in higher education that drive better student learning, that drive better graduate outcomes. Without such data, you know, judgments about the quality of higher education will continue to be made on the basis of, you know, flawed or simplistic rankings that are not derived from outcomes, not even outputs, but often just from idiosyncratic combinations of inputs and reputation surveys. You know, I've asked myself many times why your groundbreaking work hasn't, you know, taken hold faster. And I found no good answer, except perhaps that it would disrupt the current business model of governments and universities. The fact that you have now shown that, you know, this can be done, we can develop reliable measures of learning outcomes across cultures, across education systems. It should create very powerful momentum. That's why we should celebrate today and please count on the OECD mm -hmm. to do whatever we can to help you advance this agenda. Grace, Barbara, if you'd like to take the podium. So the long and winding road towards transparency on what students learn. There are not many adventure stories in the world of education. Let me introduce you to a rare exception. The publication you see today, Does Higher Education Teach Students to Think Critically? was born in very storm weather and its, its ancestor, the AHELO project, assessment of higher education learning outcomes, was pronounced dead several times. But like a cat, it has several lives. In this brief presentation, I invite you to learn more about the adventure of AHELO and the struggle for survival of this worthwhile program in higher education. In 2006, higher education ministers gathered in Athens for a ministerial conference, which, by the way, was under attack by revolutionary students and had to take place on a police-protected island. Maybe this wasn't the best birthplace for another OECD hot topic. Angel Gurria, who had just assumed his mandate as Secretary General of the organization, chaired the meeting and succeeded in convincing the ministers to embark on an ambitious new project for assessing higher education's learning outcomes. The proposed project fitted well into the main agenda of the ministerial, entitled Higher Education, Efficiency and Equity. The success of PISA was on everybody's mind, and the time seemed ripe to initiate a comparable initiative in higher education. The announcement was received as a great coup, and this remarkable phenomenon was quickly picked up by the media. After numerous meetings with representatives of International University Association, of European and international organizations, of national ministries, of individual universities, and also of media, and after heavy preparatory work with international experts in the domain of assessment and higher education, the AHELO feasibility study took off in 2008. I should add here, that the preceding session of the Education Policy Committee at the OECD Secretariat felt like it was taking place on top of a volcano. From the very beginning, AHELO had enthusiastic supporters as well as strong opponents. At the Secretariat, we worked hard, not only on our presentations for the committee, but also on our hospitality skills to ease the tensions during the evening reception. 
The principal objective of AHELO was to provide data to governments, institutions, and students on the knowledge and the abilities acquired by the end of a student's first bachelor level degree. Such data was supposed to serve multiple purposes. One, to allow governments to evaluate the quality of their tertiary human capital among the higher education cohorts internationally. Two, to enable institutions to compare and to benchmark the learning outcomes of their students against international standards in order to improve the quality of teaching and learning. And three, to empower students to weigh their learned skills against the distribution of learning outcomes in their own institution and country and against international standards. The feasibility study was designed to explore how learning outcomes could be measured internationally, providing actual data on the quality of learning and its relevance to the labor market. And the results should be comparable internationally, regardless of language and cultural background. The implementation of the test was a large-scale exercise with the participation of a total of 248 higher education institutions in 17 countries from different regions of the globe. Among those were the United States, the Netherlands, Norway, Egypt, Japan, and others, not Germany. The instruments were administ administered to almost 4,900 faculty members and 23,000 students, all of them near the end of their bachelor's degree. The OECD worked with a consortium of world experts and international teams in the participating countries. The feasibility study analyzed discipline-specific skills in economics and civil engineering, and generic skills common to all students, such as critical thinking, analytical reasoning, problem solving, and written communication. From the very beginning, the AHELO project was received with a considerable degree of suspicion. Governments were in constant fear that AHELO data would be used for ranking purposes, or as a basis to reallocate funds. The study, therefore, had two major constraints, permanent financial challenges and an inadequate, inadequate timeline. Nevertheless, the teams worked against all odds. At this point, I would like to thank Karine Tremblay from the OECD, who devoted all her efforts for several years to the AHELO project. Under her leadership, the first volume of the feasibility study entitled Design and Implementation was published in 2012, followed by volume two, Data Analysis and National Experiences in 2013, and finally by volume three in the same year entitled Value Added Measurements and the Conference Proceedings. Despite all the difficulties, the Technical Advisory Board of AHELO, the TAC, composed of international experts, handed down a positive judgment. According to the TAC, the AHELO feasibility study constituted an unprecedented multinational data collection effort at the level of higher education. They stated it was soundly executed and provided many lessons that would inform national assessment efforts for many years to come. We at the OECD were enthusiastic with this decision, as Karin Tembley resumed perfectly in the conclusion, and I quote her, the AHELO feasibility study was, has fulfilled its mandate and has successfully demonstrated that assessing learning outcomes in higher education is within reach, even in disciplinary fields that were considered to be much more challenging than the measurement of generic skills. However, as you heard, the breakthrough did not occur. While a number of countries have, stake, have taken steps with initiatives in this direction, like Australia, the United States, Brazil, Mexico, and the UK, 
there was no majority vote in 2015 for a large-scale implementation of the project. Harsh communication, like the one between the American Council on Education, co-signed by the Association of the Universities of Canada, with our former Secretary General of OECD, Angel Gurria, is only one example of the mounting pressures against AHELO. The back and forth correspondence was given online publicity, showing how prominent the agenda had become. Today, an online search for AHELO may surprise you with a number of articles and studies that have been produced in the meantime. Personally, I find that governments and national associations are very short-sighted. Sooner or later, a single country or a private enterprise will pick up this international agenda and use it for propaganda in some countries or universities. Remember what the Shanghai ranking did to European universities on the research sector? We live in times of the so-called science diplomacy, so vigorously exercised by a growing number of governments. What can they deliver and offer in terms of teaching quality of their universities? There will be more pressure from a critical audience, especially from students and their parents. In countries with high tuition costs, the demand for more transparency and accountability will grow. The publication Does Higher Education Teach Students to Think Critically? will bring more light into this area. Let us offer it as another window of opportunity to change course and to shoot for an international assessment of learning outcomes. Thank you, Dirk van Damme. And thank you, Doris Zahner, for pursuing this sensitive agenda further. And thank you to all partners involved in this endeavor. Good luck. I wish you success with which your work deserves, and may the cat live again. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to hear from Judith Eaton, who's going to kindly uh, present remotely. And this is Learning Outcomes and the Quality of Higher Education. Good afternoon, uh, good evening, and, and thank, me, thank you for including me in this important undertaking. Uh, my congratulations to Dirk, to Doris, to the Council for Aid to Education, uh, to OECD. I want to take a few minutes of your time to talk about the in intersection of critical thinking skills, quality, and quality assurance. And, and to my colleagues, in the quality assurance community, a number of whom are participating in this event, I'm offering a, a challenge. Full disclosure, I have long been a proponent of the CLA going back to its inception here in the United States. I have long supported the HALO effort and, and hoped that it would find some way to continue. And I particularly promoted both of these in the United States. Why? Because from my perspective, we all need examination of and reliable evidence of critical thinking skills from our students. So three points for you to consider. First, effective education for critical thinking skills is, is essential. It's not optional. You've already heard this. It is vital to students, our society, and our future. And second, quality assurance, with some exceptions, some exceptions, is not making evidence of these skills a top priority, at least in most places. Quality assurance community has talked about this a lot, but that is different from making it a priority. And my third point is with or without quality assurance, this work will ultimately move forward. I agree with Andreas and I agree with Barbara. So a, a bit more about each of these points, the, the centrality of effective education for critical thinking skills. We all know that we are struggling mightily with this 
in a number of countries. We're not happy with the results. We have too little information. I, I know that this is so in the United States. We have compelling evidence to that effect. And we also know from too many employers that too many students cannot function effectively even after they've earned a degree and the amount of information evidence that we have for this point is staggering in a number of instances. About quality assurance and not making evidence of these skills a priority, let, let's think for a moment. It may sound implausible today, but quality assurance was not initially created to hold institutions accountable for critical thinking skill development. Quality assurance at its inception was about how to examine institutions, how they operate, what they had in resources, and whether that operation and those resources enabled that institution to operate at, at a quality level. An extraordinarily important effort still underway in many, many countries, but I submit no longer enough. My third point, with or without the intervention of quality assurance, we will move forward with the work of examining critical thinking skills. This research, this latest effort is an example of the persistent importance uh, of doing so. And, and let me point out that to be implemented, examinations like CLA Plus do not need to engage quality assurance. Institutions can do this on their own and there is enormous demand, growing enormous demand for this. Employers have not backed off of their demands for evidence of these skills. Governments more and more are intense in their assertion that they want evidence of these skills from college graduates. And over time, these same employers and these governments working directly with the institutions, I submit, are likely to focus more and more on the information that CLA Plus provides and other examinations might provide. And over time, this information may become more important than the reputation of an institution or its degrees or even its accredited status. So where does this leave us? These are vital tools. CLA, this research, this focus on what students learn. We will all benefit from quality assurance going forward, more robustly engaging this examination. And absent some additional action and engagement by the national and international quality assurance bodies, the international quality assurance community, quality assurance can indeed be left behind as this move forward. We need quality assurance to engage and to lead. We need CLA plus, we need this kind of work, this publication. These are essential to our future. Let's establish a partnership. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Judith. And now a natural progression is to pass the floor to Doris, Chief Academic Officer at CAE, and she's going to present on the methodology behind the assessment. Has this gone? Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you for being here both online and in person. It's a pleasure and it's wonderful to be in Hamburg. It's a lovely, lovely city. Um, as we've all heard, does higher education teach students to think critically? And I'm just gonna give you a little teaser because you should buy the book <laughs> and, um, and read the report. But before I get started, I would like to just acknowledge and thank 
all of the people that have involved in this. Um, particularly Dirk, we've been talking about this publication for years and years, um, and it's finally here the day, uh, particularly for, the, for us. The OECD and Zeit Stiftung and the Bucerius Law School, thank you so much for hosting this wonderful event. All of our international uh, participants and authors, so Dirk and I are here as editors, but we have so many participating authors that have used the CLA instrument in their countries um, to measure higher education students' learning outcomes in terms of critical thinking. And of course, Capstan, who has done so much with us in terms of translating and adapting the assessment. Without them, we would not have been able to administer this assessment in all the various countries. And of course, last but not least, my colleagues at CAE, both present and past, um, and in particular, my co-author, Olivia Cordellini, who is here with me today in Hamburg, and Tess Dauber and Kelly Rothholtz. We are all authors on this, um, on this wonderful publication. So as Bob mentioned earlier on, if you don't already know about CAE, we are a nonprofit organization based out of New York, and our mission is to improve the learning outcomes of students' skills. We were originally part of the RAND Corporation and became independent in 2005. Our expertise is in performance-based assessments, and we have the assessment, the Collegiate Learning Assessment, which focuses on critical thinking and written communication. And through this instrument, um, we've assessed over 800,000 students in 1,300 institutions worldwide. We were part of the AHALO project, and as part of that, we were the generic skill, generic skill strand, and it was an older instrument called the CLA. So the plus part of the CLA, in case you were familiar with the AHALO project, is really this individual student focus, which Bob mentioned earlier. Um, we're really looking at improving student outcomes. So critical thinking, they are essential for success. We know that these are very important for both academic as well as career outcomes. And proficiency in these skills are predictive of academic and career outcomes, which is one of the findings that we have in Chapter 7. It's a predictive validity study. And yet, these skills are rarely explicitly taught in higher education, nor are they reported on transcripts. So you will not see a, a, a university transcript with grades with a critical thinking skill. And this is where the skills gap comes in, because employers are looking for students, in addition to having content knowledge, also to have higher order skills generic skills. And so there's a gap in the student proficiency. In our data in the United States, 60% of the students entering higher education are not proficient in these skills as measured by CLA. And by the time they graduate in four to six years, 44% of them are still not proficient, which is a very, very troubling number because we think and we hope that higher education does help improve these skills, and it does but perhaps not to the extent that it could. So predictive validity, we know that these skills are predictive, and in a study that my colleague Jeff Steedle and I, who was also part of the HALO project, uh, did back in 2012, we showed that CLA was predictive of higher cumulative university GPA upon graduation. And in chapter seven of the book, my colleagues and I show that it is also predictive using a longitudinal study that it is um, related to higher education outcomes and post-education outcomes as measured by salary, um, employment in their field, as well as graduate school admissions. So what does the CLA instrument actually measure? Because we've been talking about it for, I don't know, 45 minutes now. And um, we're looking at thinking about critical thinking. Specifically, critical thinking is such a large domain, and we can't possibly measure everything under the critical thinking umbrella. So we're looking very specifically at critical thinking under data literacy, which is really about can they read and interpret quantitative numbers, um, critical reading and evaluation, and critiquing an argument. And under the written communication umbrella, it's how well can students write and make an argument, as well as um, their grammar and punctuation and vocabulary that they use in their language. And since this is an international project, we are looking at not just English, but in all the different languages of the participating universities and countries. So this is, as I mentioned, a performance-based assessment. And we look at, we use real world scenarios. So we put students in a way that they might encounter something in their real life. We ask them to recommend a solution. 
And what's very unique about the assessment is that, in, similar to real life, there is no single correct answer. Let's say that they have a problem where they have to come up with a solution or a recommendation, and they c there's choice A and choice B. They can pick either one. What we're measuring is how they justify and use evidence that they're given in order to um, basically support their decision, and either decision could be correct. Or there is really no decision that is 100% correct, is another way to put it, just like real life. Um, CLA has a 60-minute performance task, so that's the section where they're reading the scenario and writing. And then there's a 30-minute selective response question, which are multiple choice items that are aligned to the same construct under the critical thinking umbrella. And we did this, this is the plus piece, as I mentioned before, to uh, have the individual student reliability so that we could issue reports to individual students to show them that they have these skills or they need to improve these skills. We also worked with Capstan extensively to do the translation and adaptation of the assessment into all these different languages. Translating an assessment is not just a matter of taking words from one language and finding the equivalent in another. There are cultural contexts, et cetera, that, are, that need to be really considered, and Capstan is the expert, and we've been working with them for over a decade on all of our assessments. So thank you. Musab, I think you signed up for this, so thank you. <laughs> um, and then uh, cognitive labs, of course, to make sure that the construct is equivalent across various countries, score training, to make sure that the scoring is um, equivalent and is consistent and reliable, and psychometrics with my team at CAE to run the analyses, scoring and reporting, which Olivia is the head of within CAE, and then of course these mastery levels, which we talk about proficiency. So as I mentioned before, preview, um, this is a little slide from the translation study, which is chapter four. So what we did was we worked with our colleagues in Finland, and we took the open-ended responses from the CLA that were in Finnish, and had them, Capstan actually did this for us, translated into English, and we stuck those English translations and adaptations into the scoring queue, so that our American English scorers didn't know which papers were the Finnish papers, and they scored them. And then the English papers that were um, from American students, we took a sample of them and gave them to our Finnish scorers. And since, we didn't, since the Finnish scorers were all proficient in English already, they scored these American student responses um, using the same scale. And we looked to see if there was equivalency across countries in both translation A, so in sample A, everything was in, in English, and then in sample B, we took the Finnish and we translated it to English. And as you can see from the table, um, we had a very high correlation between both pairs of scores within the, the study. There were about 20 papers for each set. And the overall mean scores for the papers for US and Finland scores were comparable. They were not statistically significantly different. So this is really important because it demonstrates the feasibility of administering an open-ended performance-based assessment internationally. Next one is a predictive validity study from chapter seven, and this is where we show that the CLA is predictive or is associated with outcomes um, in post-college or post-university outcomes as measured by salary and in full-time employment, employment in general, or admissions into graduate school. We looked at other variables within the model, including entering academic ability. So this data actually come from the United States only. Entering academic ability at the time, which were measured from SAT and ACT, which are college entrance exams, um, Barron's Selectivity Index, which is how competitive the university is for entrance, uh, fields of study, so what majors the students had, their gender, their parental level of education, which was a proxy for us for socioeconomic status, and then finally race and ethnicity. And we found that it is indeed um, predictive of, of these outcomes, so we wanted to be able to show this in, in Chapter 7 because we want to show validity of the instrument. And then finally, in Chapter 10, this is the United States. So in Part 2 of the manuscript, we look at individual countries. I'm sorry, it's, a part, it's Part 3. Um, part 3 looks at the individual country and participants, and United States is one of many chapters in that, in that section. And we see that there are learning gains between entering students and exiting students within the United States. So that is evidenced in um, the table figure on the left, which shows our total CLA scores. 
for entering and exiting. As you can see, there is growth on average between the students. And then also in the proficiency or mastery levels, which is the figure on the right, as the students, um, if you go from left to right, from emerging through advanced, you do see that there are more students in the graduating uh, column, which is the yellow, than in the gray column in the accomplished and advanced sections, which is what we would like to see, improvement in these skills over time. And finally, what we do in terms of how institutions and ministries can use these reports, we're very much student-focused. So we can use reports to help identify uh, country institutional-wide mastery of these skills. We can help evaluate how students compare to their peers. So even within an institution, you can see maybe certain programs need to have more interventions, or maybe certain programs are doing great, or STEM majors you know, are good at uh, the critical thinking but need help in written communication. So there are ways and you can use the data to have very refined improvements. Um, measures of quality, as Judith mentioned, and then of course to in inform professional learning needs for hiring once they graduate. It's a way that they can showcase, students can showcase that they, they have these skills since they aren't reported on transcripts. And then for the faculty, they can use these reports to help students build their critical thinking skills and actually use this in the classroom. And finally, with students, it's very valuable for them to help them gain their own and take ownership of their own learning to improve their skills. So at the end of all of this in this report, we basically came, up across, came to three conclusions. They are essential for academic and career success. So this is very important. And everyone that we've spoken to agrees with this. It's just a matter of how do you implement it. And there has been a lot of resistance, um, as everyone here has said, to how to implement this. It's impossible. But we've actually demonstrated that it is quite possible. It can be reliably and validly measured in a cross-cultural context. We show this through a halo and also through this report that it is indeed possible to do it. And then finally, these are skills that are associated with better outcomes. So don't we want all these students to actually be critical thinkers so that they can contribute to their workforce and to society uh, in, in a meaningful way. So it is an essential component of higher education and its best practice, and we're hoping that we're, we have opportunities to uh, speak with more people about this work. And lastly, I just wanted to have one, one more thing. Um, this is a slide that actually shows a model in practice. So we have a very large university, public university within the United States called the Texas A&M University. And the Mays Business School within Texas A&M has decided to partner with CAE to improve the ability of the students to think critically. So their students already do very well, but they wanted to be able to do better. And so what they did was they assessed all 1,100 entering students in their first, I would say, second week of time in the university. So they're brand new students. And brand new students are much more agreeable with doing things that they're told than uh, the exiting students. So they took the assessment. Um, and then we use the reports to help them identify and improve their skills. So there is a curriculum piece that is associated with this. They applied their skills in the classroom and they were looked to improve it. And at the end of their time within the university, they were assessed again and given a credential. So you see that there is a feasible model to do this and a way and to improve it. And there is curriculum that can be used specifically either within a classroom, within context of the, of the, of the subject, or outside of the classroom in generic skills format to do just a, uh, you know, a workshop or, or curriculum um, reform. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Doris. And now we'll pass the floor to Dirk. Um, wherever you are in the world for the online participants. Um, good day, good morning. Um, I'm very pleased to, to be here uh, at the end of a, a very long journey. Um, and I want to thank uh, a couple of people um, before I start the presentation and be sure that's the final presentation. Um, first of all, Doris. Um, it has been such, a, such an experience, and it's with a little bit of pain that I see this journey now coming to an end. Um, so many times that I traveled to New York or that you came to Paris to, to meet and to work on, on the manuscript. Uh, of course, I want to thank the, the authors and, and our colleagues and countries who have uh, 
uh, spent so much time and energy on this and who were also very patient with all the editorial work that needed to be done. I want to thank CAE, I want to thank Andreas who has continued to support this even if um, and I'm a bit hesitant to say we did this work without any mandate, without any money, without any support officially, but uh, with a strong support from the leadership at the Educational Skills Directorate, Andreas, and before Andreas, Barbara, who has been, uh, of course, the first believer and the uh, instigator of this work. Okay, um, let me focus on a couple of general um, findings of the, of the study. Uh, I won't take long on the rationale why we did it, um, because Barbara, Judith, Andreas have already uh, mentioned a lot of things, but I do believe that the issues that have been mentioned become more pressing. They are not going away. Um, I think there is a real danger that university qualifications lose their signaling value. Um, and we see this in, in reactions of employers. We see that many international organizations and uh, corporations are now saying, well, we don't ask anymore whether an applicant for a position has a university degree because it doesn't say anything. We will just test them ourselves. Uh, and that's, that's really taking place. Generic skills such as critical thinking are becoming increasingly important. Um, because of technological changes, digitalization, which Andreas also mentioned, um, because of mobility on the labor market, close to 50% of our labor force in, in Europe is working in a job for which he or she has not studied. So it is the generic component of what people bring from university into the working life, which is becoming much more important. So the, the disconnect between qualifications, what they value, what they signal, and the skills that are awarded in the workplace, that's becoming a real risk for higher education. And if higher education is not taking this risk serious, it really takes a very challenging future. So we, we don't have a lot of data. That's already very clear. We don't have metrics on what the student learning outcomes can be on teaching and learning quality, despite um, the fact that universities say, yeah, that this is our primary mission. Um, but we are evaluated on the basis of our research. We are evaluated on the basis of our internationalization effort, of our uh, connections to industry. But the primary mission of teaching and learning, we just don't know what's happening. Um, and that lack of transparency um, is really a very important issue. And one of the reasons why we think that this work should continue and why we thought that it it is worth doing it. A few words on the, on the project itself. So it, it started actually after uh, what Barbara described as the failure to reach a consensus in the constituency of the Education Policy Committee at the OECD. Um, and a couple of countries said, well, we don't want to leave this here. We don't want to stop this here. Um, but yes, there is no mandate, there is no money. Um, so they convinced uh, Andreas and myself to silently, prudently um, continue um, the work. Um, that's in fact the origin. So between 2016 and 2021, um, we have been working patiently with um, a number of, of countries. Originally, there were more countries than the ones who are now in the book because some dropped out. Um, some showed interest and then they came to meetings and then they left. Um, so the potential was bigger, but the, let's say the six countries who are now reporting their results in the book, they are the, the diehards. They did really, uh, they were the strong believers and they moved the project um, forward. The OECD did not provide any financing. All 
the efforts uh, at institutional and national level are financed by institutions and countries uh, themselves. CAE provided the instruments, provided the, the data analysis, uh, the psychometrics, the translation efforts, etc., etc. So a big thank you for that. And the role of the OECD was to be a kind of platform to coordinating efforts, to bring people together to discuss issues um, and to uh, see where this could uh, go. Um, in this effort, um, over 120,000 students have been tested. Um, most of them, of course, in the United States, where CAE had this long tradition um, of doing the, the assessment, um, but also, uh, as you know, in, in other countries. Uh, Italy was the first to follow the United States, uh, Mexico, the United Kingdom, Finland, and Chile. So a, a very interesting global distribution, very different countries, very different higher education systems, which yeah, created a lot of challenges, which Doe is mentioned in translating and making sure that the instrument is behaving in the same way in cultural different contexts, etc. So. You see the numbers of students tested uh, in these um, five years, five, six years. Um, all countries did uh, implement the test for entering students and um, exiting students, except for Italy. Um, so when we look at learning gain, we uh, don't have data for Italy. Um, that's a, a bit of pity, uh, but all the others um, did as well. Um, very different. Uh, systems, and you will see in the country chapters that the um, country experiences are also very divergent. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, it was a difficult effort to bring this together and to make one story out of it. Um, we did this by pulling all the data together in one big international database and to make sure that the data Met, were matching each other and that they could be um, compared. And I will give you just a few highlights from the analysis of this big international database. Um, in line with what Doris mentioned already for the United States, um, the average of all the country averages is that 45% only of the tested students are proficient in critical thinking and the skills that the CLA Plus instrument is testing. Um, this is not much. This is not something to be proud of. Uh, if we say to the economy and to society and to the labor market, yeah, um, only not even half of our students at universities are able, are proficient in critical thinking, this is not a very beautiful message to bring. But there are enormous differences between countries. There is an enormous uh, difference in the minima and maxima that you see in the table here. Um, but even more problematic I found is that the number of students or the percentage of students at the highest level of proficiency is so low. Um, and if you look at the definitions of the mastery levels, that's not extraordinary. You, you would expect an academically trained person yeah, to, to be proficient at that level. But we speak about 1.7% on average. Um, in best country, 3.7% uh, of, of, um, of students. And uh, in contrast, one in five, but again with differences in, some con in, in one country, even 41% are behaving at the lowest proficiency level. Let me focus then on learning gain, which means comparing the results of entering and exiting students. Um, so entering uh, first year students, exiting in the final year of the first degree, which is in most countries a bachelor degree, but can be a three-year degree or a four-year degree. Um, so what's the difference between the proficiency level when they come in and when they leave? That's actually the question that we ask with regard to learning gain. And on average, again, the result is, is 
yeah, is a bit problematic. Only 2.7 percentage points difference between those two cohorts. Um, it's not this longitudinal. It's not the same students that we test in the entering and then exiting. And so it's comparing two cohorts um, of students. So the learning gain in critical thinking, it exists. It is not what we aspire or desire that it would be. But again, huge differences between countries. You see it, and I'm coming back to this with this slide. You see the five countries which have data on learning gain, so not Italy. Um, deliberately, we did not name the countries for the simple reason that it would just be methodologically not correct. We don't have representative samples. We have countries with small sample sizes um, and on the basis of two to 3,000 students shaming and blaming a country is not what we want to do. We just want to highlight differences. Um, and the differences are real between countries. But maybe with representative samples, they would look um, differently. But you see that, and that's, I found that very, very interesting, that the arrows in the five countries are not the same. Um, Actually, you have countries where the uh, low levels of proficiency on, in entering students are high. So very few entering students with high levels of proficiency, but they do an effort and they are realizing a learning gain. Country C does not realize any learning gain on the contrary. And exiting students slightly perform worse than entering students. But country D has already a high level of proficiency with entering students, and it even succeeds in improving the proficiency when students leave. So the message is, it is not about selection effect. Because that's an argument that you often hear. Universities saying, we have to work with the students that we get in. And it's all the fault of primary and secondary school education. No. Of course, you work with the students that you get in, but you have the possibility to do an enormous pedagogical effort and to bring students to a higher level of proficiency, like country D is doing, and in some degree also country E. So the learning gain is completely independent from the proficiency level of entering students. So that's where the teaching and learning quality comes in. It's not only determined by the students that you get in. There is a possibility of realizing a very high teaching and learning quality environment, which makes students develop those skills. The second question that we asked is, what is the role of social background, of socioeconomic status? Uh, and we know from PISA that this impacts very much on student learning outcomes. Um, one of the follow-up analytical questions that I have is, I want to compare the impact of socioeconomic background in PISA with that that we found in this study. But intuitively, the impact in higher education is a bit lower than in secondary school education, which is maybe understandable. But parental education background plays a role. Uh, it plays a role, um, and it means that there is a selection effect in the, in the students entering universities. They are not equally distributed. They are not uh, fairly distributed um, in society. But interestingly, also the learning gain is affected by socioeconomic status. In this case, parental education background, which is a reliable um, proxy for socioeconomic background. Um, so the learning gain, at least among non-US countries, is slightly higher when the parents have a higher education qualification. Um, so that's, a, that's an interesting observation. But in the United States, that's not the case. And that's, I found that one of the most interesting findings of the report. We have the idea that the United States higher education system is highly inequitable, that it's 
um, that it has a lot of inequity built in it. And in Europe, we sometimes say, well, we are proud that we have more equitable, equitable access. But the learning game in US higher ed education institutions is more impressive than in Europe or other places that we have examined, and is less connected with socioeconomic background. You see that students with lower parental education background, they do as well in learning gain than students with parents who have a university qualification. Only in the US, not in the other countries. And the next question, I forgot the number I used, field of study. Are there significant differences between fields of study? And the answer is yes. And this is not surprising because uh, in US data before this project, uh, we already saw um, differences between fields of study. And it's very strange to see business studies so low. Uh, and the, 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 the difference is, is really significant. On the top are humanities. Humanities really do a good um, uh, effort in, in raising critical thinking skills of their students. Um, also social sciences and the natural sciences. Um, more applied fields of studies do less well, um, which is actually a, a little bit problematic. I would not, I don't find it a positive result that critical thinking is associated with very advanced academic learning like in the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. Critical thinking should also be part of the professional skills of applied programs. Um, and that's uh, maybe another interesting thing to, um, to consider and to follow up. Field of study in the US, um, it's basically the same with some slight differences. I will not go into detail. So a couple of Key takeaways, um, if you want to have a very brief summary of, of, the, of the general findings of this report, only 45% is sufficiently proficient. The learning gain is small, but with huge differences. Um, performance level of entering students are not related to learning gain. So there is no relationship between the selection effect and the education effect. Impact of parental education background is significant, but the selection effect is stronger in the US. But the impact of parental education background on learning gain is less important in the US. Significant differences between field of study, uh, both in entering students as in learning gain. Okay. Um, I don't want to take too much time, uh, and I don't want to go into detail on individual countries. Um, um, Finland is a very interesting case, so I might, uh, because it adds a couple of elements to the analysis that are already made. And Jani is here, who is the coordinator for, for the study in Finland. Um, it is uh, a very interesting uh, implementation in Finland because it's a system-wide um, implementation with uh, a sample which is more or less considered to be representative because so many institutions in Finland participated. Um, you see some elements that I already mentioned, eh? so the difference between in this, in this language initial stage and the final stage of the bachelor degree. But what is very impressive here, and it's in line with what I said a minute ago about fields of study, is the huge difference between university students and students in universities of applied sciences, um, the Fachhochschule uh, in Germany. And for countries with a binary education system uh, in higher education, um, I think this is a very important observation. It needs to be replicated in other countries with a binary system, um, but it's something that uh, is specific uh, to those systems because, of course, in the United States you have an enormous variation of, of, um, of institutions, but it's not possible to link that to, for example, the Carnegie classification in the United States or uh, whatever. But in Finland this is possible because you have those two big um, chunks um, in the system. 
Um, also very interesting in Finland in the Finnish chapter is the gender differences in favor of female students. Female students score significantly higher than uh, male students. This could also be the case in other European countries. Um, and again, uh, as in other countries, a significant impact of um, students' prior educational trajectory and uh, family background. England is also an interesting case because there the implementation of uh, CLA Plus was part of the, uh, a government initiative, the Teaching Excellence Framework, and it was actually meant to be a diagnostic tool for institutional improvement, not so much for accountability reasons or quality assurance reasons, but for institutional um, improvement. And I think the chapter describes very well how institutions can use the CLA Plus to improve their teaching and learning. And Mexico uh, is also a very interesting case, but because there it's implemented in a huge um, um, university system, univer the system of the University of Guadalajara, which is about 100,000 of students in many, many campuses. Um, what is unique there is that the University of Guadalajara is using the CLA Plus as one of the formal assessment tools for students at graduation. So the, it's, it, it takes a formal place in the in university career of students. Um, but what is yeah, also striking in Mexico is the enormous impact of poverty of students and of geographical um, disadvantages uh, because those campuses are located uh, in so many different uh, areas. So the power of geography place here in Mexico. Okay, I will finalize. Um, you have to take into account the limitations of the study, even if I'm very proud and very um, confident about the study. We did all possible efforts to, to guarantee the methodological qualities and to make sure that what we say is supported by, by the evidence in a, in a scientifically um, robust way. Um, there are limitations we don't have representative samples. Sample sizes in some countries are, are not, uh, not sufficient even, maybe. Um, and there is a selection bias. That's probably one of the biggest challenges that um, students drop out of the test, do not complete the test, um, stay away because they are not obliged to take the test. So there is a, there is a real selection bias. Um, and we also found that student engagement, there is a very nice section in, in the book, I forgot in which chapter, about student engagement and effort. Um, we see a very clear correlation between the effort that students took in doing the test and the results of the test. So um, student engagement is a very important um, element. And um, I think a, a follow-up study should really take this uh, forward. But the positive conclusions is, first of all, it is feasible to do this. Critical thinking is a difficult construct. It's not uh, so easy to test as just content um, in, in a certain discipline. Um, so it is uh, difficult to do, but the instrument is there. The instrument is valid. I, I can Really, with, I'm, I have no stakes in CAE, but with the hand of my heart, I can say this is an excellent instrument. It does what it's supposed to do. It does it well. Uh, the psychometrics are fine. Uh, the reliability, the validity, predictive validity, all aspects are fine. It's not evident to develop such an instrument. Eh? Um, at the beginning of this effort, I actually did um, a, a study of all possible instruments of generic skills in higher education. And there were the, actually, there's a long list. I came up with maybe 30 different instruments available in the world. Um, and because I was a bit afraid of the criticism, we had OECD is again teaming up with CAE, and why CAE? And that was an argument during uh, Hello, um, et cetera. And OECD has to have good reasons if it partners with, a, with this uh, organization. But the quality of the instrument is what is really convincing me. Um, it, there is no real competitor. Maybe the only competitor is uh, the, 
the test of the educational testing service in the United States, but it does something different. It is not going into the heart of critical thinking. So it is feasible, and there is an instrument. Um, students are improving their skills, um, and it's actually the entire distribution which goes upwards. It's not specific parts of the distribution which improve and others which don't improve. It's the entire distribution which goes up, which is a good thing. So if universities are doing what they are supposed to do, they do it for all students. Um, but the learning gain is not what we expect from higher education. That's maybe the most important message. Um, I actually already mentioned this, the contrast between the impact uh, of family background on the selection of students at the entrance of higher education and on learning gains. So the, um, the relationship between selection and education, um, which is a very intriguing theme um, also in the report. Political context is very important. All countries have mentioned this in their uh, chapter. Um, if there is political support to do this, both at the national governmental level and at the institutional level, it, it, it is a success. You can do, you can do it. If there is no support, it is very, very difficult to do. Um, and we have seen this, of course, in the history of AHELO as well. As in PISA, and Germany is, of course, an excellent place to say this um, with the PISA shock, um, but assessment drives the reform agenda in education. Um, the reform of higher education, updating it, improving it, modernizing it to the needs of the 21st century will only be possible if there is a reliable assessment. Um, that's, that's the fact of life. Um, you can have all kinds of ideas and political visions about higher education. If we don't have the data, if we don't have the assessment of what students actually learn, there will be no reform of higher education. Um, so that's a lesson from PISA and a lesson from this exercise as well. And finally, student motivation is critically important. Uh, I, I know that CAE is thinking of all kinds of developments to improve student engagement and digital badges, for example, uh, a student having a kind of micro-credential able to show to an employer, I succeeded in this test. Um, the students need to have something that answers the question, what's in it for me, in order to drive their motivation and their effort. The prospects are, yeah, it's an open question. Um, there are real prospects. Uh, I hope that this book uh, triggers countries and institutions to move forward because it is a major tool, not only for benchmarking and accountability, but also for quality assurance, for improvement, for students, and for employers, for the stakeholders in higher education. And I'm apologizing for taking too much time, but I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. So we're now going to open up the floor to a question and answer session. Uh, we'll do it for half an hour till 8 p.m. before I close it. And we'll take questions from both the room and all of you that have been participating online. Um, so I must admit, Doris, we got a lot of comments when you presented. A lot of people want to ask you questions. So I'd like to start with you. Okay. Um, first of all, could you elaborate a bit on the psychometric validation of the assessment and how is proficiency determined? So, for example, when you say that uh, a percentage of students are proficient. Um. So we conducted a standard setting study where we convened a panel of experts that looked, that actually took the assessment themselves and then set standards or descriptions of student, how should I put this, um, of student performance and these characteristics that demonstrate the different levels of proficiency. So emerging and developing each have their own set of skills that they can do, but a lot of the description is how can they improve to become proficient. And so proficient, accomplished, and advanced, the students earn proficiency and they're able to do, you know, 
for example, they can read the documents and they can answer the question and come up with a recommendation, but they aren't able to cite all the evidence or they're not able to refute and look at the counter argument. And as they become accomplished and advanced, they're more able to do that. So it was done with a standard setting study, which is standard practice for assessments. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Dirk, a very interesting question for OECD um, staff or previous staff. How much is the learning gain of higher education measured by CLA Plus in line with findings from PIAC? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think grossly it's rather in line. Um, so, but PIAC, of course, is an assessment of different competencies. It's uh, literacy, numeracy, and, and problem solving. There are some constructs and, and also items which come close to what is assessed in uh, CLA+. Plus. It would take a very interesting study to compare the two. Mm. Um, maybe that's something for the PIAC team to pursue once the new uh, PIAC data come out in, in 23. Um, but we saw more or less the same kinds of tendencies uh, in, in the PIAC data. And I reported on, on a couple of them in, in the first chapter of the book here. Um, so yeah, unexpectedly high numbers of students with low proficiency. Um, and, and so there is, there is some analogy between the two, but yeah, you should not confuse the different constructs eh, with this. The two are assessing different things. Um, PIAC has its value for higher education. Uh, it has shown that um, a qualification is not signaling the same level of skills, even in the Bologna area. Mm -hmm. There are so big differences between some countries in the Bologna area, even if they now use the same qualifications. Um, so that's something that we learned from PIAC. But um, I think this study and, and the CLA Plus is going much more into the heart of what an academic education mm. is. Um, it is supposed to be about more than literacy, numeracy, and uh, problem solving. Mm -hmm. Great. Are there any questions in the room? Yeah, um, yeah Manuel Hartung, I'm with the Zeit Foundation. Um, so let's try to transform that intriguing results into the practice of universities. So let's let's imagine uh, you'd consult university leaders. Um, let's say here at Pizzeria's Law School or at the University of Hamburg close by. What would be your recommendations how to reshape the curricula or reform um, the teaching agenda, the teaching style uh, you have? So what's your like five point program all universities uh, leaders should put into practice? Yeah, that's a um, truly excellent question. Um, there are some hints in the book. Um, and also, the, for example, the last slide that uh, Doris showed um, shows that as an institution or as a program designer or a program director, you can really um, integrate elements of critical thinking explicitly in the curriculum. Um, I personally think that it goes, and. I have been a university professor for many years myself. I have seen things evolve in, in my own university, my own faculty. Um, critical thinking uh, is something different than moving to um, testing regimes, which we know are now dominant in universities. Um, the, the writing academic papers is not always seen as a valid assessment tool for, for, for students. Um, so I think there are real possibilities. We did not explicitly uh, talk about this in the book, um, but there are definitely possibilities to improve the teaching and learning environment and the assessment culture in universities in such a way that they make those skills more transparent and that they incite students to develop those skills. Maybe Doris, if you have. Sure, um, <laughs> great question. The model that I talked about in, in the last slide was really just one example of a way in which an institution can implement improvement in critical thinking. It's basically assessing all the students as they come in. So assessment 
I think in many places is seen as a negative because it's a test, and especially if you're an outside organization coming into an institution and giving a test. Uh, faculty in many cases are very resistant to it, but if you can get them to see the utility of getting the information about their students' skills as they enter, and then having some kind of program to help them improve and getting the faculty on board to see this as everybody wants to improve their students' knowledge and skills. Most faculty do it within their content area. So for example, I'm an instructor, a professor in statistics, and I teach statistics to applied science uh, um, and social science students. And I use this model of integrating critical thinking into the course, giving them cases, rather than having them fill out multiple choice tests as a midterm exam, for example, or to do something similar for a final, I give them real data. So giving them experiences and having them be performanced and integrating critical thinking into the classroom. And then at the end, if you wanna look at quality assurance or student learning gains, assessing students as they exit to see how much they've actually improved. And Texas A&M is doing this and it's going to be a longitudinal project where we follow them over the four years of time. Mm. But it's one model. It's not the only model, of course. Barbara, did you want to follow up? Yes, I wanted to uh, just remind you what Andreas Schleicher also said. Um, it's not teaching and learning just information, because that you can do a search and you find information very easily. But it's really to solve problems, to think critically about a case study. And I'm sure the Butzerius Law School will also have <laughs> case studies in order to make uh, students participate in solving uh, a problem and to think critically about who is <laughs> who is really the good guy and the bad guy, right? <laughs> well, and for PIAG, I would also like to um, give an additional information for those who are not familiar with the program. It's the adult um, assessment, and it just followed PISA. And uh, it had uh, also some very revolutionary findings. Um, and in, in Germany, we were also um, very um, shocked by the really low base of um, skills in, digital, uh, in the digital sector. So um, we were thinking at some point in the past, couldn't we use PIAC actually for the assessment of higher education learning outcomes. But the bridges were too difficult and the partners were different. But I think it would be great if some of these findings could also be combined to the, your new results. Mm. Yep. Thank you, Barbara. I actually want to ask you another question. Uh, uh, well, it's, it starts off as a comment. Don't university, universities cater to demand the latter of which are money and growth base biased to please investors, is there not a conflict of interest in assessing critical thinking? In, um, well, I think universities can do better than that. Mm -hmm. And um, they can uh, also convince employers um, how they go about it. And it's the transparency that really mm -hmm. matters um, how they use these instruments. And I think... Um, that can be done and that can be bridged. Yes, um, Tatiana. Thank you. I was wondering when I studied in the United States, my, uh, I was asked to uh, provide the university with language proficiency, the TOEFL test, and also the GRE. And I asked myself if this is not an entrance for a GRE for critical thinking, for, for assessing at the, right at the beginning, <laughs> in the middle and at the end. So university, as you said, Doris, they can do that by themselves. Uh, we actually, great question, Tatiana. We actually looked into using CLA as an entrance assessment. Um, mm -hmm. And the, in the United States, at least, the two other college entrance exams are the SAT. The two college entrance exams are predominantly SAT and ACT. Um, and they're is no market for that because it's a barrier from the discussions that we had uh, with admissions officers. It's a barrier to entrance. It's another barrier to entrance into university. And the model that we came up with was you, the students are already <laughs> having to overcome these things to reach the university. And once they're there, that's when you can measure them 
in terms of where they are, where they start from, and where you can get them. So as you see in the data, as Dirk was showing, there is a huge opportunity for learning gain. And if you know where your students start from, then you know what the interventions are. So we, really there, wasn't, there was a lot of resistance to this idea of having another test be for college entrance, but there's very much we see a need for it to be used for students once they have entered university to get them the opportunity to, go, to grow their skills. Thanks, Doris. Um, we actually also have a question of the provision of micro-credentials sure. for cri uh, critical thinking. Um, so how do we know that we measure by a test a construct that can be fairly labelled as critical thinking? Um, are you sure that we can measure it, uh, assess it, certify it? Critical thinking and problem solving per se, they're not related to a specific field of study. Um, and if yes, please justify. Sure. Um, so <laughs> this is a question that a halo, it was very much part mm. of a halo. Generic skills and the whole book, this book, <laughs> shows us that indeed we can do this. We can measure generic skills, critical thinking. And as I mentioned in my talk, we're not claiming to measure all of critical thinking. Critical thinking is a huge domain. We measure very specific subcontracts, uh, subconstructs within critical thinking. Analytic reasoning, problem solving, and then the communication pieces. So, it, I mean, to say we measure all of critical thinking, no, I don't think any assessment can do that. But what CLA does is measure and does it, we do it very well. This analytic reasoning and evaluation and problem solving We've demonstrated this successfully um, through the multiple countries where we've administered this. And if you'd like to know more about the methodolo methodology, you can read the chapters in, mm. the, in the manuscript. Yeah, Thanks, Doris. Go into much more detail. Thank mm. you. Uh, Dirk, I have a very interesting question on uh, the learning gain uh, and parents' education. Can this be explained by the fact that more educated parents may have more money to support their children studying and hence can, the children can concentrate on studying and work less? Intuitively, I would say no. I don't think it's a question of money. It's a question of pedagogical culture in the, in the, in the family. Um, and that's why we tend to use at the OECD parental education background as a better proxy for socioeconomic status than income or uh, employment levels of, of or occupations of parents. Uh, yeah. So because we think that in education, it is really about the, um, the stimulating family environment, um, reading books, having access to information, have, having discussions with parents uh, uh, at the dinner table. Yeah. And that kind of, of issues are uh, supporting uh, not only cognitive skills of students, but certainly also the, let's say, the advanced skills that we are now talking about. Um, so uh, for maybe financial resources do play a certain role if you are limited in uh, your learning uh, opportunities because you have to earn uh, the money for your own study. Um, that can have an impact, but I'm not a big believer in the um, and, and the fact that everything is economic or financial, mm. I really, of, because I am biased, I'm a mm. pedagogical researcher by nature, so I believe in the power of pedagogy mm. and the power of having a very stimulating parental environment. Mm. Thank you. Have we any more questions from the room? Yes, we do. Thank you. Yanni. Thank you all to the, all the presenters. My question probably is something that I should ask at, as a final question, but nonetheless, I will ask it now. Uh, as we already heard from Barbara's presentation, Ahela was very controversial undertaking, and now that we listen to what uh, we, we heard about this latest book, it seems that for sure it's feasible to measure the learning outcomes of undergraduate students, whether they are generic skills or something else. Uh, and there are lots of limitations, of course, involved in that. But I mean, that's true for all the other large scale assessments that we have, like PISA and PIAC as well. But my question is that what are the next steps to keep the cat alive? I mean, does OECD <laughs> have something in, 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 in his or her pocket to, to keep this initiative alive? Because like I said, in Finland, we've 
been very favorable towards our halo and also we now continue in measuring the, the uh, generic skills of undergraduate students in the future as well. But it would be nice to know if there would be great company of other countries joining, joining us in the future as well. So thank you. Maybe I can answer first of all in a broad sense. Um, the experience is countries need to really be motivated, and they are the ones who express their interest. So we can only hope that also media will pick up now these findings. And with the help of media, um, we could really see an echo in society. And uh, um, then there will be a mounting pressure for more transparency in this system. And we have to hope that there will be a reaction and that government will feel now it's time. Ahelo apparently was still too early, but I think we are now in a more mature world of transparency and accountability and where also uh, the clients, the students are very much aware of what they should really get for the price they pay. <laughs> so I hope it will, it will be solved. Uh, I fully agree with Barbara. Um, I just would like to add one important voice, that's the voice of employers. Mm. I really wish that employers become more vocal about higher education. If you speak to employers and, and corporations, international, national um, uh, companies and firms, they are all criticizing universities in silent conversations, <laughs> and they are not willing to express that publicly. Um, but they say, the students we get, they have marvelous degrees and they don't have the skills that we, that we need on the work, in the workplace, uh, in the 21st century workplace with digitalization and with the transformation of all kinds of processes. We need different people and we don't get them from universities. That's a rhetoric that I hear again and again and again when I meet with, with those people. Um, and I think it's very important that they raise their voice in the national debate about education, and certainly higher education also in the international uh, debate. Um, Doris, I have a question for you, or maybe Judith, if she's still online, I'm not sure. Um, do we know if Judith is... Oh, I think I see Judith. Yes. yes. <laughs> Hi, Judith. Um, do your results correlate at all with the cum laude awards at many academic institutions or with the Pi Bet Kappa related awards at the supposed higher, higher end of the academic performance scale using grades as a foundation? Um, I can say that grade point average is correlated positively with CLA plus scores. Mm. We don't, we, CAE does not collect information on these other credentials. Mm. Um, so we don't know. Individual universities themselves may have that research, but we don't have that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Judith has more of a high level view of, mm. of this. Thanks, Doris. Uh, no, no, Doris, I, I, I don't. One thing that could be done, but I'm not sure how valuable it would be, is to take a look at uh, at least in the U.S., the accredited status of the institution vis-a-vis uh, -vis the results you have. And when you look at that accredited status, these days you get information about any concerns or particular strengths of a college or university. And I don't know whether any correlation would emerge mm. from that. It might be interesting to, to look at. And I certainly don't know about any, uh, any causation. Mm -hmm. I can say, though, that we do collect Barron's Selectivity Index within the United States, which looks at how uh, difficult or challenging it is to enter into a college or university. And in the data that we have, and this is not reported in the book at all, this is just separate research that CAE has done, although there are correlations between the average scores and the selectivity of an institution, the learning gains is not necessarily correlated. So you can enter in um, a less competitive university and still have very large gains and exit and graduate with accomplished or advanced even. We've mm -hmm. seen this um, mastery levels. Great, thanks Doris. Barbara, I have a question for you. 
um, and then I'll, I'll pass the floor then to, to Doris. Uh, it's more of a comment. It's, uh, someone says, would it then be better to measure these presented generic skills in a future a halo? This person says that it seems more realistic and relevant than trying to measure the disciplinary skills and knowledge. Um, so what would your opinions be on that on a future iteration? I think that would be a good way forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we have seen, um, even the generic skills uh, could be reflected in different disciplines. And that already um, shed some light also on uh, the possibility to either raise it more or to interfere or whatever. So I think it would be a great way forward. Mm -hmm. Olivia Tess and I actually have a paper on this that we presented, was it this year? That was April, huh? Yeah, well, that seems like a long time ago. Um, we presented this paper which measured, which looked at whether the assessment itself was measuring truly generic skills. So we looked at fields of study and the performance task topic that we were, we were giving to students. And the operational forms of the assessment itself does not show an interaction between field of study and the form of the assessment that they're giving, which is indicative of the fact that we are measuring these generic critical thinking skills outside of domain knowledge. Now, we do find, and as consistent with the book, that there are differences in average scores of CLA by field of study, yeah. but the assessment itself does not interact with that. Yeah, right. Great, thank you. Uh, I, I'll leave this one out for anyone to answer. It's quite broad. What do we know about critical thinking and its relationship to other personality traits? <laughs> uh, that's a that's a difficult one. Um, so the assessment of what we call in the OECD social emotional skills um, is only starting. Mm -hmm. um, I also supervised the report which was published last year, uh, which is the first international study on the assessment of social emotional skills, uh, and we used the Big Five. So uh, about um, uh, conscientiousness, openness, uh, introversion, etc., etc., um, and we did it with 10 years old and 15 year old. Um, it's a very interesting study, but to jump from that study to critical thinking in higher education is a too big leap uh, mm. to do it. Uh, with it. it is quite possible that certain um, generic skills in higher education have a, a link with uh, personality traits or social emotional skills that I would not exclude it, but it's premature to say anything meaningful about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so just in terms of then the different types of students that we would have in higher education, we have a few questions regarding that as well. One is the, what is the significant impact of STEM on uh, STEM subjects on critical thinking? What came out of the report on that? Those students in that field do tend to do better than mm. students who the implied. I mean, we, we don't know if it's self-selection into the field or if it's the curriculum itself, um, but we do see effects for, for fields of study. Mm. Okay. So then as a follow-up to that, Doris, uh, humanities and social sciences, mm -hmm. um, they, they're said to be doing well in critical thinking. Correct. But these genres are not very popular in job markets. So this person... Uh, I would argue that that's not necessarily true. Okay. I mean, I think you can have a career, as you, as, as um, Dirk mentioned, there are students who are in different fields professionally than what they, mm. what they study exactly. within the university, and that's what generic skills are for, they're good for. If you are proficient in these critical thinking skills, um, you can potentially work in other fields other mm. than outside of, of yeah. social science. I fully agree. I would not like to buy dinner for all philosophy graduates uh, entering computer sciences. Mm. <laughs> um, so um, I, I personally think that the humanities are in a process of revival after many mm. years that they have been a little bit in the, in the, in the corner uh, because of utilitarian tendencies at universities, the emphasis on STEM, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think that there is scope for um, yeah, a, a bright future for the humanities. And the fact that they are scoring so well in, in, in critical thinking is probably a good sign for that. Mm. Great. 
Do we have anyone else in the room that would like to ask a question now? I, I have two more I'd like to ans ask. All right, so the first one, I'll direct it mostly to Judith and, and Doris. Um, so someone has asked, will there be a follow-up study? Can an individual university take part? What is the future of the assessment and what would you like viewers of this webinar to take away from this meeting? Uh, great questions. So yes, <laughs> you can. any individual university can absolutely participate in any level. If you want to look for institutional learning gain for quality assurance, we absolutely have that available. Um, if you want to do the model like I mentioned where you're assessing your entering students, that's available. The instrument is very flexible. So I think my contact information is somewhere. Mm. So please reach out and I'm happy to send papers, et cetera. Um, and the assessment itself is continuing and we have participating institutions globally, mm. mostly within the United States, um, but internationally as well. Mm. Great. Um, I'd like to wrap it up because we're getting close to dinner time mm -hmm. with a sort of a dinner party question. Um, <laughs> I think it's unfair for us to make the title of this publication a question without actually asking all of you your, your sound bit. Mm. Does higher education teach students to think critically? <laughs> Who goes first? Uh, the answer is yes, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but not sufficient. Mm. I agree. I think yes, and we can do better. Mm -hmm. Yes, more efforts have to be made, and let's hope that this study will be a wake-up call. Yeah. I think that's it then. I would like to thank you all for coming for your very interesting questions. Um, I'm sad to kind of see all this wrapped up now because <laughs> I've also been working very hard with Doris and Dirk. Um, so with that, yes, I'd like to thank you and, and invite you then to enjoy a drink and, and mingle a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.